in this module, we're really gonna take a look at the magic of zirconia oxide and why it behaves like it does and um, why we can treat it the way we can and why we can make it as thin as we can, use the margins that we wanna use. And one of the first questions that dentists have is, well, isn't zirconia a metal? And I don't know if you remember the periodic table of the elements um, from whenever you saw it last, probably in college. I don't think we looked at it in, uh, in dental school, but you can see uh, zirconium. It's in that group four, those transitional metals. It's right under titanium. So it's uh, in a sense kind of related to uh, titanium and zirconium itself um, is actually a metal. And you, you can see a couple zirconium rods right here. And that's what, what it looks like. Um, Maybe you saw the HBO series uh, Chernobyl, uh, a fantastic watch if you haven't seen it before, but that's these are part of the cooling rods where they're trying to cool down the core of the reactor because it's very good about dissipating temperature. So that's zirconium, but zirconia oxide looks like this, looks like a big pile of Coke from Scarface sitting on the, uh, on the desktop. And that's what zirconia oxide looks like, this structural ceramic. So it's the same way with like, um, if you remember Procera, it was alumina oxide and it was a white powder like this, whereas aluminum, of course, itself is actually a metal. And that's one of the, the differences that we see between the two. So it's got a metal heritage, if you will, uh, as zirconium, but the zirconia oxide is the structural ceramic and looks like you see over there. And I'm saying structural ceramic and not glass ceramic like we would for Emacs because there's no glass in it, but more on that later. So to really understand why solid zirconia can do crazy things like us hitting it with a sledgehammer on a two by four, and I'll show you that um, later if you haven't had the chance to see that and why it acts that way, it has to do with its crystalline structure. And so we need to look a little closer at this. So there's three different potential crystal structures for zirconia oxide. So at room temperature or anything below 1170 degrees Celsius, it's in this monoclinic crystalline structure. And you can see it looks like a, um, a long rectangle that's been shoved up a little, like it's been squeezed almost together. It's, it's been kind of shifted and, and busted up a little bit. Um, if you heat it up uh, over 1170 degrees Celsius, it goes to the tetragonal crystalline structure, which you can see is now just a regular looking um, rectangle. It doesn't, it hasn't been stretched at the two corners like the monoclinic has. And if you heat it up even more, to over uh, 2,370 degrees Celsius, which is uh, insanely hot. It goes to the cubic structure where it's now a cube, as you might expect from the word cubic and cubic zirconia is something uh, dentists are, are very familiar with. This is uh, typically the ring that you got for your second wife, which is ironic. You probably should have got it for the for the first one, but uh, cubic zirconia we've seen for many years as a, a diamond replacement and it takes an expert eye to see it. But cubic zirconia, it's interesting now, you've always seen it looking like a diamond and being very translucent. And now you know that it's one of the phases of this, you'll begin to understand why translucent zirconias have more cubic structure in them, more the crystalline cubic structure than the monoclinic or the tetragonal. And that's important for the translucency, but you also have to kind of pay the price. So as all three of these are up in the screen, what we really wanna look at is that the cubic is the most uh, compact, the smallest volume that the crystalline structure can get into. Tetragonal is a little bigger, and the monoclinic is even bigger than that because it's the tetragonal one where it's been stretched a little bit. So it's again, you know, uh, three, two to 3% bigger because it's stretched at those corners like that. And this has become, will become important for why it's got the strength and what, what's gonna be called the transformational toughening um, that it does. So again, by heating this, you can take it from the monoclinic to the tetragonal, heat it even more, get it to the cubic. And as, that, as it cools down again, it'll go from cubic to tetragonal back to monoclinic again. And so what we want to do in dentistry or what we originally did in 2009 is we wanted to keep all the crystals in the tetragonal phase, in that, that middle phase at the, instead of the monoclinic. And so we're gonna to have to add some things to it to get it to do that. And we'll look at that in the next module. Um, but what we wanna do is keep it in the tetragonal stage at room temperature. So we have to dope it 
with some things to keep it there. And why is that important? Well, it's important because of what happens if you if there's a, a fracture or a flaw introduced into the zirconia material. So when you look at what you see right here, this is um, one of the class five zirconias. If you remember when we looked at that classification, this is a, an original full strength zirconia. So all of those aqua honeycomb crystals that you see there are tetragonal. So this is 100% tetragonal zirconia. And what happens, this toughening mechanism, is when you have a crack that starts in the material, the energy that's released from that crack, you can see that around, they call it the wake around the introduction of the fracture. In that wake, think of it like a wake almost behind a, a boat, you know, pulling a skier, the wake that comes off the back of a boat. That wake, all of the zirconia crystals there turn to the monoclinic from the tetragonal. So they go from the rectangle to the stretched rectangle. And because they increase in volume a couple percent when they do that, they actually get bigger and they, they keep that crack, they compress it together as you'll see here, and they clamp down on that crack to keep it from going any farther, any deeper in the zirconia material. This is almost like a magic trick. I mean, it's not magic because it's, it's chemistry and science, but when you have a crack that starts in the zirconia, whether it's from a patient biting down on something hard, whether it's from you adjusting it um, too much or whatever happens to something, uh, to the zirconia crown that might start that fracture, when you've got that 100% tetragonal uh, TZP zirconia, when the crack starts, it releases the energy, the crystals around it go from tetragonal to monoclinic, they clamp down on that crack and they keep it from going any farther. And they, it's still open at the surface a little bit, but it won't go any farther down into the material. And this is very impressive. And what this looks like clinically, this is from Rella Christensen's um, study that she's doing on Emacs and um, original Broxer and now some other material. So it's about eight years old uh, at this point, probably nine years old actually now that we've changed. And you can see this is an original Bruxer crown and it's got three different little flaws on the crown. And this has been in the patient's mouth for eight years. That first one on the left, that, that yellow arrow on the left is a flaw that happened after year one. The one in the middle is after year three and the one on the right is after year five. And that's the one we're gonna zoom in on. Take a look at that. That's, now, if you've never looked at SEMs of porcelain before, this is something you just won't see on any other kind of ceramic material. This crevasse that you can see there. I mean, we've just got this kind of hole, like a little Grand Canyon going down into the crown, but it hasn't broken. Any other ceramic material shears off and fractures when that happens to it. But this is that transformational toughening where it's going from the tetragonal to the monoclinic and stopping that crack from going any deeper, which is um, really impressive. And the reason why we can get away with uh, solid zirconia, the 100% tetragonal sin is six tenths of a millimeter. And we can do knife edge margins and things like that, that we're gonna talk about. One other thing I wanna bring up in this section is zirconia glaze, because this is something that also that Rella is passionate about. That's an SEM on the left, uh, one of the original Bruxer crowns being put into place the day of uh, delivery. And then over on the right, this is a year later, and you can see that glaze wearing off of there. And the glaze is wearing off. And what's the price of that glaze wearing off? The wear of the opposing teeth. So originally everybody was worried about opposing teeth being worn uh, by zirconia. Rella has shown that that only happens when the glaze is on there. And once the glaze gets worn away and the opposing tooth gets worn, um, the wear stops afterwards. And so Rella is very passionate about not putting glaze on these zirconia crowns. You should ask your lab to polish your zirconia crowns. That's a polished zirconia crown on the left, an A2, and that's a glazed uh, zirconia crown on the right. I know the glaze looks a little better. That's what we're used to seeing in dentistry. The one on the left, the polished one, looks a little better when it gets saliva on it. But the one on the left will not wear the opposing tooth because it doesn't have any glaze on it. In fact, it receives more wear from a natural enamel tooth than it gives to the enamel, which sounds incredible, but it's true, it's the opposite of how PFM crowns used to be. I'll show you that in a second. The one on the right, it's what we're used to. It looks prettier, but you're gonna cost some wear of the opposing tooth. And when it wears off, that surface gets rougher on the crown itself. You should be asking your lab 
to polish your zirconia crown. So why doesn't the lab polish them? Is it any easier? No, it takes longer. It takes longer to polish that occlusal surface and all the surfaces than just spraying it with some glaze and running it up in the oven for a couple of minutes. This is what the original Bruxer looks like, an SEM of the material itself. And you can see it looks like pebbles, kind of a smooth riverbed almost. This is Emacs, so these, these crystals look like bacillus or bacteria, um, but all the glass has been removed here, so all those black spaces you see in between those rods, that would have glass in it normally. And that's why it's more translucent than zirconia. Zirconia doesn't have any glass in it. So the glass has all been removed so you can see uh, the lithium disilicate rods that are there. So the glass makes it more translucent. The glass is also what we etch with the hydrofluoric acid. So that's why we get a better bond strength, the resin cements to Emax, than we do uh, to our original full strength zirconia. And the last one we're gonna look at is uh, traditional feldspathic porcelain. Look how much glass is there. All the smooth islands in the middle, that's all glass. And that's why feldspathic porcelains are the most translucent material we have. They're gorgeous but it's also why they're weak. They're all glass. It's like taking a drinking glass and dropping it onto a hard floor. Glass does not make it strong. It makes it weak. And furthermore, when you look at the particles in that feldspathic porcelain, they've got irregular rough edges to them. You know, they're not smooth like the lithium disilicate, um, but that's even got some glass in it. And you look at the original Bruxer and how smooth that is, again, like that riverbed with the pebbles in the bottom of it. So the feldspathic porcelain on the bottom needed to be covered with the glaze because how rough it was on opposing teeth. And we've all seen this. Here's a PFM on uh, tooth number nine. And this patient swears it used to match tooth number eight, but tooth number eight is like a C10. So I don't, I don't, I don't know if they ever matched. Who knows? Creative memory. All the glaze you know, and the staining is gone from that crown on tooth number nine. But when we have the patient open, you know what we're gonna see. He's eating away these lower anterior teeth. He's slowly been digesting them um, over the years and uh, he eats them away. And that's why we put glaze on feldspathic porcelains to stop that kind of wear. But once the patient would wear through it, that kind of wear would stop. I saw it happen in my grandmother's case. She had PFM crowns on seven through 10. The wear got really bad when she got older and got Sjogren's disease and with the lack of saliva. Now she was really going through those lower anterior teeth. Uh, so the good news is if we don't glaze solid zirconia, we don't see any wear on the opposing teeth and Rella's got the SEMs to back it up and you'll see some uh, a little bit later. So that's why we wanna polish solid zirconia uh, especially in the posterior of the mouth where we have all that wear. In the anterior, yeah, have them glaze the facial surfaces. That's gonna be fine. Even if they glaze the lingual, that's fine too. But I want you to understand the concept of why the glaze used to protect us with the PFM because of how rough the feldspathic porcelain was, but it's actually a liability now with zirconia because of how smooth that surface is. And the glaze is a thing that causes the initial wear. So there's no reason why any of your laboratories can't polish your solid zirconia, and they should be. If you remember just one thing from the whole material section, um, ask your laboratory about polishing your, your zirconia. It's the right thing to do for the patient's opposing teeth. Um, it's just the right thing to do. If they really want to, if they want to glaze it around the axial and you know leave the uh, occlusal polished, that's fine. But actually, if you don't glaze around the margin is just polish, you get way less bacterial adherence because bacteria does not adhere well to zirconia oxide, but it does to the glaze, which is much, much rougher. So again, have your laboratory start polishing them. And once you get a little saliva on them, they look like they're glazed in the mouth. Out of the mouth, the glazed always looks better because that other zirconia crown is still dry. Okay, so in the next module, we're gonna go over the differences between classes of zirconia, look at the difference between the 3Y, the 4Y, the 5Y, how we get some of these materials to be more translucent than the others, and what effect that has on the flexural strength and the indications on where we should be using them.